Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the Ateneo. Uh, my name is Abe Vasquez. I'm a, one of your Athelos for this year. In 1972, the film Buck and the Preacher was released starring Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte, and Ruby Dee. It was one of the few Westerns to feature a black hero and was also directed by Poitier himself. Commenting on his experience, Poitier stated, I rolled my camera for the first time. I tell you, after three or four takes of that first scene, a calm came over me. A confidence surged through my whole body, and I, as green as I was, had a touch for this new craft I had been courting from a distance for many, many years. The film was one of the first of the genre to tackle issues of racism and violence in the American West. However, it received mixed reviews and was not an immediate financial success. These setbacks can be attributed in part to the film being perceived as foreign by audiences given its distinctness as a Western among black exploitation films of the, of the time. Regardless, Buck and the Preacher paved the way for future films that centered around black cowboys and pioneers and showcased the talents of black actors and filmmakers in an industry that had previously excluded them. Joining us tonight to discuss the larger social context of films such as Buck and the Preacher, as well as the evolution of black Westerns in general, is Vassar College professor of film, Mia Mask. Previously, Professor Mask uh, was published for the 2014 edited collection, Poitier Revisited, Reconsidering a Black Icon in the Obama Age. As the Mary Ripa Ross Professor of Film at Vassar, Mask has excelled in sharing the lessons found in African American cinema, documentary history, uh, feminist film theory, and many more. Her written works and commentary have been featured by NPR, Cineast Magazine, The Philadelphia Inquirer, and other. Professor Mask has also authored Divas on Screen, Black Women in, Amer in American Film, which features a historical and industrial examination of notable African American women in show business, such as Pam Greer, Oprah Winfrey, and Halle Berry. Before welcoming our speaker, we ask the cell phones to be silenced and put away and kindly remind the audience that video and audio recordings are strictly prohibited. At the end of tonight's presentation, there will be some time for questions and answers. Professor Mass at the NAM presentation is supported by CMC's Presidential Initiative on Anti-Racism and the Black Experience in America. With that in mind, please welcome to the app, Professor Mia Mask. Wow, that was such a lovely introduction. My colleagues don't introduce me that well. Thank you. <laughs> really. Um, well, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this evening. I am, I've traveled from New York and I made it. <laughs> so it's great to be here. And um, I want to thank Professor Warner for this lovely invitation and for Priya Janar for all of her work in helping me to be here with you. And so I'm excited to begin by showing you a clip from a, uh, a context that I provided for the Western for Alamo Draft House movie theaters. And um, so this is sort of my introduction to black Westerns. And it's a great way to kind of give you a quick overview. And then I'll move into some PowerPoint slides to give a little bit more context. So why don't we start with this clip? Hi, this is Mia Mass. I'm a professor of film at Vassar College, where I teach African American cinema, documentary history, theory and criticism, and a range of genre courses. But I'm really excited to tell you about my new book, Black Rodeo, which is a history of the African American Western. And it covers a range of films, from Sergeant Rutledge all the way through to Django Unchained and beyond. So why don't we get started? The Western is easily the most impactful American film genre. First of all, it's the genre most intimately linked with our national history. It's also the genre that has been most involved in the mythologization of that history, the kind of embellishment and rewriting and reimagining of that history. It's also the genre most linked to this notion of manifest destiny, the idea that certain people, certain groups of people were entitled to move in, settle, and claim the land as their own. But all of those sort of social and sociological reasons aside, it's also an important genre because it's the one most linked to other genres. So when we're talking about the Western genre, we're really talking about the reinterpretation of history into cinematic myth. Dominant history 
is really told by those who are in power and those who've had the military prowess or military might to displace native peoples, to enact laws, or maybe even to conscript former slaves, formerly enslaved persons, into service in the American cavalry. So when we're looking at the, the Western genre, we want to think about that backdrop and that history that's been turned into mythology. So there were some early notable black cowboys. Chief among them was Bill Pickett. And Bill Pickett was an early rodeo and trick rider who rode in the Miller Brothers uh, traveling rodeo. He appeared in early silent films and on what we call actualities, but he was also in feature films. He was in a film titled The Bulldogger and in a film titled The Crimson Skull. And so he was one of the first to be uh, featured in uh, what we would now call early westerns. And beyond him, we might think of somebody like Nat Love, who was another uh, important uh, ran uh, sort of rustler, cattle rustler, and cattle driver, trick rider, known in various territories from Tennessee to Kansas and beyond. There were some early movies and filmmakers that really helped to get the movement of black filmmaking started. Chief among them was Oscar Michaud. And Oscar Michaud was a maverick filmmaker who started making films in the silent era, and he made films from the teens all the way through the 1950s. Two of his films that stand out are The Homesteader and Within Our Gates. But The Homesteader is what we might describe as an early Western, and uh, he wasn't alone. There were folks like Spencer Williams or George and Noble Johnson. These were other African-American uh, writers, actors, directors who were actively involved in making uh, all black cast films in the teens and even into the 1930s and 40s. In addition to the black filmmakers, you also had folks like Richard Kahn. Uh, and Richard Kahn made three all black cast westerns directed three that we know about Harlem Rides the Range, Two Gunmen from Harlem, and The Bronze Buckaroo. And all three of these all black cast westerns went on to be very successful with black and white audiences. These films fought the erasure of African Americans and other people of color by incorporating African Americans into the central cast into the not just the supporting players in the backdrop or the mise-en-scene, but actually uh, the protagonists of these films. And so you begin to see people like Woody Strode, Jim Brown, uh, Fred Williamson, and many others starring in Westerns and being the primary focus or the characters that are driving the narrative uh, trajectory. And that was a real sea change or a real shift that happens in the post-World War II era. So there were black westerns earlier than 1950, but the genre of black westerns really takes on a more political direction or political trajectory after World War II. And I hate that. Do you hear me? I'm a man. If we look at the films in which Jim Brown starred, like Rio Contro and then A Hundred Rifles, and then we follow his career uh, through to Fred Williamson's career and even uh, Sidney Poitier's directorial debut, Buck and the Preacher, we see that the films begin to turn up the volume on the political content, on the ways in which the black cowboy is demanding and ultimately expecting respect uh, and becomes a leader in these narratives. So he moves from a silent trope, as in, say, John Ford's Sergeant Rutledge, where Woody Strode almost doesn't speak in the film, to becoming active narrative uh, agents. Not only are they agents of action, but they're agents of change. So in Buck and the Preacher, Buck is a seminal figure, a central figure in creating Native American and African American coalition against white supremacy. 
Just as mainstream westerns evolved and combined with other genres, so too have black westerns. They have changed in style and form alongside Hollywood films, and they've continued the tradition of presenting African-American perspectives on contemporary politics. You see over time the way black westerns begin to amalgamate, incorporate a range of other genres to reward their loyal fans, the, the western spectators, by bringing in some of the visual pleasures of other genres and just mixing it up to create something that is recognizable as a western but still pleasurable in other ways. I hope all of you have enjoyed it. I hope by word and mouth that you will uh, pass this around because it's, it's quite a thing for the Americans to know all of this history and not have any of it edited out. So if anyone is interested in learning more about these films, check out my book, Black Rodeo, A History of the African American Western do now is just spend a few minutes taking you through in a little bit more depth and detail the arc of the book and and some things that are not explained here either in the video and to some extent not even addressed in the book to give you a sense that I'm not by any means saying that all of these films are perfect or are without or beyond critique um, or that there aren't flaws or things that we want to examine more closely but it was it was a really wonderful and fun book to work on because in the process of researching this book like I would I would tell a go to SCMS which is our big annual conference sort of analogous to MLA and I and I would see colleagues and they'd be like oh you know me what are you working on and I say well I'm doing this I'm working on a new book on the western and they'd be like oh really I said yeah no black westerns and they're like there are enough westerns to write about so even amongst my colleagues it was uh, uh, there's a sort of a learning curve in, in terms of offering to the discipline of cinema studies the, real, the realization that there are a collection of what we would call African-American themed Westerns worthy of uh, close examination. And they date back all the way to the earliest days of filmmaking. Okay, so uh, I have here um, a still from Thomasine and Bushrod with Benetta McGee and um, Max Julian, but I want to uh, start out, uh, as I always do, by making a clear distinction between history on the one hand and the Western on the other. Because I think far too often people get the two confused. <laughs> and it's very important to remind people that, the, that Western movies are about the mythologization of Western history. They are not history. They very rarely reflect history accurately. But that doesn't mean they're not important, right? We want to think about them as part of our cultural mythology because they do impact the way we act, the way we think, the way we imagine uh, various spaces and places, and the importance that we give some of these spaces and places. So I was influenced in uh, my thinking about this project by particular texts, including Philip Durham and Everett Leroy Jones, AKA um, Amiri Baraka's The Negro Cowboys, which is a book that came out in 1965. And um, then uh, um, uh, additional texts that I always like to call to people's attention are to the work of William Lorenz Katz and Sarah Massey, among others. And then sometimes people say, well, you know, uh, were there any black women or any women of color, you know, in, on, in the West? And I absolutely, and I, you know, say yes. And, you know, again, we want to separate their stories and background uh, and the actual history of who these women were from the mythology in uh, folk tales and stories and plays and movies. Right, so Tricia Wagner does this work in her book, African American Women of the Old West. Okay, so then I, it, it comes to what am I sort of trying to accomplish with this book? And I found along my sort of research and journey that uh, there was very little that had been written about the African American experience in the West, either, um, you know, in, in, excuse me, in Western cinema. But even at the time I began this book, 
the, the literature in the discipline of history proper was still evolving. So there was very little that had been written. I found, obviously, uh, Jacqueline Kilpatrick's Celluloid Indians, but that's obviously about uh, Native American representation. Angela Elise, Making the White Man's Indian. Uh, she has a new book as well about uh, Native American representation in more, uh, um, in more recent films. Uh, there was Imagining the African American West and Michael Johnson's Hoodoo Cowboys and Bronze Buckaroos, which is a little bit more limited to uh, African, uh, early African American Westerns. Uh, such as uh, Harlem Rides the Range and Two Gunmen from Harlem. But there was almost no uh, examination of the post-war Westerns, right? Of Sidney Poitier's Westerns, of the sort of black liberation phase of Westerns, or the documentaries uh, by Jeff Canoe, Black Rodeo, from which my book gets its title. And more on that later. I'm excited to tell you about sort of like, finding that film and then uh, working on that film. So those were, you know, some of the companion titles. I also, you know, like to, again, in foregrounding history, call our attention to uh, the Buffalo Soldiers of the 25th Infantry, some of whom are wearing Buffalo robes in this uh, slide here, pictured at uh, Fort Keogh Ma in Montana, okay? <clears throat> also, um, we, I just want to share some of the monuments uh, that uh, have cropped up since the late 80s and 90s that have begun to uh, pay homage and um, in addition to paying homage to the um, efforts and the expeditions and the uh, experiences of Buffalo Soldiers, they mark uh, historical intervention. So, um, a lot of people know the term Buffalo Soldier sometimes only through the Bob Marley song, right? So it's, it's just uh, important to help people understand that uh, these memorials are now being uh, placed in a number of locations. So um, there is also this Buffalo Soldier Memorial in El Paso in, at Fort Bliss depicting Corporal John Ross of Troop 9, the Troop 9th, uh, uh, 9th Cavalry during an encounter in the Guadalupe Mountains during the Indian Wars. And what we know is that um, they were, Buffalo Soldiers were renowned for their bravery and their horsemanship in the Civil War and in the American Indian Wars. And this is uh, the monument in El Paso. Uh, the Buffalo Soldier Memorial of El Paso in Fort Bliss is, um, I'll get the year for you. I don't remember exactly what year that was installed. Okay. And then in the, there's representation, obviously, in the portraiture, right, that uh, depicts the uh, expeditions. And this is of, in, of Sergeant Emanuel Stance, right, and the troopers of the 9th U.S. Cavalry in one of their many uh, clashes between cultures uh, in uh, the West. Okay, so from that backdrop, from the, the sort of historical backdrop, I recognized, okay, there are a number of films that uh, are about, around that have recently been restored, The Two Gunmen from Harlem, Harlem on the Prairie, Harlem on the Prairie is a 1937 film by Sam Newfield, and the story concerns the events in the life of Doc Claiborne, who returns with his medicine show um, and young daughter, Carolina, to the country where 20 years before he had been a rider with a gang of outlaws and assisted in a gold robbery. Now, the, the gold was hidden when all uh, but Doc were killed in a fight with a posse and was never recovered. And when Doc is on his way to recover the gold and wipe out the memory of those early days, uh, he encounters some difficulty. And so the story sort of begins there, okay? And then Two Gunmen from Harlem, which is also pictured here, is one of the Richard Kahn films that I mentioned in the documentary. Okay. So Harlem Rides the Range, Bronze Buckaroo, these were two films I thought, well, I don't want to cover some of the same ground that 
uh, Michael Johnson has just covered in Hoodoo Cowboys. And so I, I didn't w really feel the need to go back to the 1930s and write about some of these films, but I recognized that it was really Sergeant Rutledge, John Ford Sergeant Rutledge, and we were talking about this film just seconds ago at dinner, at the dinner table, um, that uh, was a great point of departure for me because it marked uh, the beginning of some of um, what I'm saying is sort of, sort of sea change in the Western. Now, this, this film is certainly not beyond reproach or, or critical uh, analysis because in the film, Woody Strode plays a very staid character who doesn't speak for most of the film. And so he's a little bit of the noble savage, if you will. And so it's a problematic kind of construction of him. And in many ways, as we were saying at dinner just now, the film's a little campy, a little bit cheesy, a little bit too much of a, of a melodramatic courtroom drama where Jeffrey Hunter is, um, in, is his superior officer assigned to defend him. But this wasn't a still, yet and still, with all of its flaws and campiness, and it's a kind of a naive camp rather than a deliberate camp, with all of its campiness, it's still, I think, a text worth looking at and marking as a point of, of, of uh, you know, change of direction because it's one of the first films in which you have an African-American uh, character, a cavalry officer, being foregrounded as a protagonist, right? And in a major Hollywood film directed by none other than John Ford. And John Ford at this point, 1960s, so this is after The Searchers, after he's already begun to take this sort of um, turn into looking at the underside of the Western and the anti-hero, and he's trying in some ways to, Ford is trying to redeem his own um, reputation with the, with the Western and some of the things he's done. He's trying to make a kind of conscious, socially conscious Western with this film. So I, I felt it was a great point of departure. Um, and so just have some still from that. The next sort of text that I uh, move into is the uh, Jim Brown star vehicle Rio Concho. And so the next chapter really takes up Jim Brown's celebrity. He stars in Rio Concho alongside Wendy Wagner, who was 23 year old, 23 years old at the time, so it makes us think about the sort of like uh, the little bit of the imbalance of the age of the actor versus the actress, kind of like in High Noon, we have a you know uh, uh, much older, um, uh, much younger uh, um, Grace Kelly and uh, much older Gary Cooper. <clears throat> so. She's 23 when she gets the role of an Indian maiden in the 1964 Western, uh, in which Wagner uh, sort of dabbled in acting for several years and then finally uh, moved on. She married and divorced Robert Mitchum's son, James, and made uh, her last big screen appearance in Guns of the Magnificent Seven in 1969. Um, okay, so this is sort of his first foray as well into the Western. And he, he, it's his role here is a little bit conventional, but um, he will then go on to make other Westerns. Now along, oh, did I skip a slide? Let's see, no, okay. <clears throat> now that's released in 64. Two years later, Sidney Poitier is cast in his first Western. He's cast in A Duel at Diablo alongside James Garner. What's interesting about this film is a couple of things. He, is in this film uh, at, at a, a time when he has already made an, uh, Lilies of the Field and won the Academy Award for it with Ralph Nelson. And it's not in, you know, it's some, something worth noting that Ralph Nelson d directs him in this film as well. So 63, he wins the Academy Award. This is three years later. He uh, is finally making a Western. And I say finally because one thing you may not know about Sidney Poitier is that he always loved Westerns. And Westerns were why he got into filmmaking. And, and uh, this was because as a young uh, person, as a child in Nassau, Bahamas, growing up there, he uh, saw Westerns and was mesmerized by them. And they always sort of enchanted him. So he'll make Duel at Diablo. And um, I love this sort of little excerpt here about Poitier 
Uh, this is in the promotional material that uh, would have gone out to theater. See, they're telling you how to advertise the film. You can get little banners for your movie theater and uh, how you should dress your theater up and what your ticket prices should be. But the little excerpt from down below here is, Poitier plays the role of a gambler and horse wrangler in Duel at Diablo, and this is his first appearance in a Western. The fact that there were Negroes among the best in horse wrangling is borne out by the reputation of rodeo champ Roy Kirk, who does the trick riding for Sydney in the film and who was also responsible for selecting, training, and monitoring the 200 horses used in the cavalry Indian fighting sequences. So those of us who are equestrians or riders or just love horses <laughs> can appreciate this. But it's also interesting because, again, people think that not only um, you know that African Americans uh, don't ride, don't uh, own horses, don't train, don't um, you know are completely unfamiliar. So it's just important to sort of re-inscribe or to insert uh, this history into the narrative of um, those who worked in film and and behind uh, the scenes as well. Okay, wonderful still from Duel at Diablo. Uh, and here you see Sidney Poitier and B.B. Anderson, who had starred in many Ingmar Bergman films, and she plays the sort of uh, mother character and, and the, sort of the ingenue in this film. 1969, three years later, Jim Brown makes 100 Rifles in a sort of interracial buddy film in which he's cast with Burt Reynolds. And this is sort of the, yes, and, and this is the, uh, uh, next sort of film in what I describe as his early trilogy, if you will. So there's um, uh, El Con, uh, there's uh, Rio Concho, Hundred Rifles, and next comes El Condor, in which he co-stars with none other than Lee Van Cleef. And for those of you who remember High Noon, you know that Lee Van Cleef uh, became sort of iconic uh, after that film, and then would go on to also appear in Spaghetti Western, Sergio Leone films, and be known forever after as Angel Eyes. So uh, we see this film. Now here's a film that I don't necessarily, uh, oh, let me just give you a little uh, summary. El Condor, released in uh, 1970, is a film about the Spanish and Italian, sorry, the American, uh, uh, we'll come back to that, <laughs> okay. So um, Man and Boy is the next uh, film that I wanted to share with you, but is not necessarily in the book. So, or not in the book in any sort of um, way that's in, in depth. It's uh, a film that stars Bill Cosby and um, who else would you recognize? Um, it's a family, oh, Douglas Turner Ward, the uh, famous thespian, and Gloria Foster, who had appeared in films like Nothing But a Man. It's a family film, and I don't include it in the book because it's more of a coming of age story. So it's more of a like, um, uh, of a story of a young boy, and it's, it's similar in some ways to uh, Gordon Parks' is The Learning Tree, for example. Okay, great. So. Um, the Skin Game with James Garner and Lou Gossett uh, is definitely uh, meant to be kind of tongue-in-cheek, campy, co intentional, deliberate camp. Uh, and it's about two friends, clearly the beginning of the interracial buddy movie uh, formula. And they're two con men who run a con game on various towns, m run their con game, and get their money, and move, move on. And what I say in the book about this is that this film, uh, I think, really set the stage for the early Gene Wilder, Richard Pryor comedies that came in the 70s, like Silver Streak, um, Stir Crazy, et cetera. OK, super. So just trying to keep track of time. We'll wind down in a second. So um, you've heard me talk a lot about uh, Buck and the Preacher. Uh, and this is a film that Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte 
uh, co uh, co collaborated on. What's fabulous about this is they had had a, an argument and hadn't been speaking for three years. They had a falling out over, yes, over um, an event that Harry Belafonte wanted to plan. He wanted to organize a, uh, a big vigil after Dr. Martin Luther King's death. And Sidney Poitier was concerned about what might happen and would it be problematic. So they had this big argument and they, weren't, they hadn't spoken for three years. And then, um, and I discussed this a bit in the book, they also have discussed this on TV, on the Dick Cavett Show. They overcome their difficulties, they come together and they make this film. And it's a film of which, you know, film which I, admired tremendously for what Poitier attempted and what he achieved. He really achieved at some level a critique of white supremacy that had not been in popular cinema and it had not been in um, the Western genre at all. So you have Cameron Mitchell playing Deshay uh, on uh, the um, tales of the coattails of this wagon train of exodusters moving out west and these poor newly freed newly manumitted folk are trying to settle out west and the the basically what amounts to the clan or night riders are paid to hunt them down and try to intimidate them to come uh, back to the south uh, and work uh, back on plantations and Poitier's buck and uh, uh, Belafonte's preacher uh, defend this group. It does have problematically Julie Robinson uh, Belafonte, uh, Harry Belafonte's wife, in red face, if you will. She is uh, playing a Native American woman, though she's a white character, though she's a white woman. And, you know, again, I, well, I'm not saying that any of these films are perfect or beyond reproach, but they definitely mark a real shift. This is a beautiful still that I love from the film and a beautiful shot of Ruby D riding on horseback and that in and of itself <laughs> makes the film in some ways notable and worth uh, looking at. This is just a review from Vincent Canaby talking about the film. Uh, Buck and the Preacher is otherwise a perfectly ordinary example of the kind of Western that seeks to prove that the West was not lily white. The movie West, of course, has never been completely lily white. There have always been a certain number of Indians horsing around, scalping, drinking, shooting, getting shot, and being poorly dealt with by just about everybody, including the movie makers. For the most part, however, blacks showed up on the frontier only as servants or occasionally as outcasts and loners, most notably in Ford Sergeant Rutledge and the man who shot Liberty Valance. If they do nothing else, these new soul westerns, right? We have spaghetti westerns, we have soul westerns, we have sauerkraut westerns, right? The German Karl May westerns. Um, if they do nothing else, these soul westerns may serve to desegregate our myths, which have always been out of the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. I'll let you mull over that one and, and see how you feel about that. Okay, these are just some stills that I'll go through really quickly from none other than Jeff Canoe's documentary, Black Rodeo. This film was like the Phantom Orchid. I went to the Library of Congress, I was doing a research project and found this, uh, this film, this documentary by accident. And it was, I got to see it I think on 16 millimeter and looked for it thereafter everywhere and couldn't find it. Years later, when I tracked down the director, Jeff Canoe, I said, you know, I first saw your film at the Library of Congress, and I haven't been able to find it on film anywhere else. It's finally on DVD, so I was able to get it, but where, he said, Mia, that's the only copy of my film that exists. So I was like, wow, I'm, <laughs> I'm very lucky that I saw it when I saw it. So it's a wonderful documentary, cinema verite style, about uh, this traveling all-black rodeo that performed on Randall's Island in Manhattan and its appeal up to the residents of Harlem. Uh, and there are a whole range of classes or events that are featured, uh, bronc riding, bull riding, barrel racing, and there are adults as well as children who perform in the rodeo. And then something really amazing happens. Woody Strode shows up. And you're like, what? So um, Woody Strode makes a cameo appearance as does Muhammad Ali. 
So it's a very unusual uh, film. And just by way of a footnote, I'm saying in this slide that um, rodeo culture, uh, specifically African American rodeo culture, is alive and well, uh, as evidenced by the new books that have been written about the active uh, and vibrant presence of black rodeos, including the Bill Pickett Rodeo, which I want to come back out here to see. I hear it's alive and well and, and very well attended. Um, uh, the next chapter deals very closely with um, Fred Williamson and all of the films that he made, uh, including what I describe as a kind of Westploitation trilogy, the Charlie films. I don't talk about Blazing Saddles because I think there's probably enough written about Blazing Saddles. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it obviously, as you all know, stars Cleavon Little and Gene Wilder. Um, again, in what would be kind of a precursor to the Richard Pryor, Gene Wilder films. Um, Moore, Jim Brown, and uh, Fred Williamson in a fabulous culmination of, you know, of their star power because it pairs or couples or, or groups, Brown, Lee Van Cleef, Williamson, uh, Jim Kelly, among others. Okay, the last chapter of the book deals with Posse, Rosewood, and Django Unchained. So I include um, a kind of close reading of Posse of, Jim, of um, uh, John Singleton's Rosewood and encourage in talks that I've given at sort of like um, various museums, including the James Museum in Tampa, Florida, uh, include references to and encourage folks to take a look at Edward Gonzalez Tennant's book, uh, The Rosewood Massacre, for the actual sort of background on uh, the Rosewood Massacre and what happened, because there's quite a lot of additional archaeological uh, research that's been done that's uncovered even more uh, stunning uh, facts about the tragedy. Buffalo Soldiers is a made-for-TV Danny Glover star vehicle uh, that is a 1997 film, so it came out in the same year as Rosewood. I don't talk about Wild Wild West. You know, this was, maybe some people remember uh, Wild, the Will Smith, Kevin Klein, uh, Selma Hayek uh, star vehicle that was a remake of the sort of um, the, the classic film. And again, like I said, the book sort of winds down with Django Unchained uh, and a discussion of The Heart of the Fall and Concrete Cowboy. So I'll stop there. And uh, why don't we take some questions? Thank you for listening. <laughs> Comments, questions, reactions? Thank you to Professor Master for that wonderful presentation. As she mentioned, we will now transition to Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, we ask that you come up to this mic. Um, we ask also that you introduce what your name, major, class, year, and try to keep it to one question if possible. Thank you. Hello again. Um, I'm Melanie Kala. I'm a sophomore at Claremont McKenna College, and I'm studying international relations. Um, my question, I mean, I have multiple because I would love to continue the conversation of the white savior trope in the Western film in yeah. relation to films like Broken Arrow, yeah. um, Dance with Wolves, etc. But I've instead chosen to ask you if there was any Western film whose ending you would change, which one would it be and how would you change it? I am kind of stealing from one of Professor Warner's essay prompts, but yeah. <laughs> All right, well, hopefully you've done the essay already, right? Yeah. Done that assignment already. Um, well, that I would change the ending. Hmm, okay, great, let's see. Hmm, there was one. Again, that's so hard, because there's like so many. Um, yeah, uh, let me pick one. Well, do you, well, why don't we pick, why don't you pick, and then I'll, I'll think about the ending. Do you have any favorite Westerns? Okay, I, I did discuss in my essay High Noon and okay. how I would have preferred to have it end. So that would be interesting for me to hear, or if you like pick one of your favorite. Okay, Western all right, so let's talk about the ending of High Noon and we can talk about the ending of some others. So I, I'll tell you why I like the ending of High Noon and we can just agree to disagree or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I like the ending because 
it comes full circle and calls our attention to the fact that um, that film's really a metaphor for McCarthyism, mm -hmm. right? And his struggle to find someone who will stand up for the town, right? He can't, he can't find anyone. And the, I think it's so poetic that, the, uh, that, that, that ironically it's Amy who has, to, who has to help out and defend him. And so it's going against all of her principles, right, and her beliefs. But at the same time, um, there, were, there were no men, right? And what's interesting about that is that the Western genre is so much about masculinity, right? So unless you're talking about the discourse as masculinity, and I dip into the scholarship of uh, various folks who write about masculinity, chief among them Michael Kimmel, right? And um, the, the genre is grappling with masculinity and that, that Amy has to man up right, in a way that none of the men in the town will, is speaking volumes and signifying on uh, the failures of commun and the lack of community and the mm -hmm. fact that people acted out of you know, cowardice rather than out of bravery. So I like that ending, even though I agree with you, Melanie, it's unsatisfying because mm -hmm. you feel frustrated or one, the one, a spectator feels frustrated or angry uh, about the fact that he has been left to just to manage on his own. Um, how would you change the ending? I'm so glad you asked, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of okay. Katie Hurado's character, like, mm -hmm. huge fan, and to me, um, what's, the white woman's character's name again? Amy. Amy. Yeah. To me, it would have been more realistic for Amy to be on the train leaving town. And for Katie Hurado to, to stay. Family. Because that was so in her values to stay. And I feel like it wouldn't have been unrealistic for her to do so. <sighs> because <laughs> she had so much power and force as a character, even despite her being a Latina in that town, and how she was able to play within the system to gain that power, both yes. economically, politically, whatever it may be, yes. um, through like, for instance, her hotel room or the salon which she owned and her shares in what was like the convenience store, or, or yes. um, forgetting details. It would have made more sense to me for her to be standing next to the main character fighting than for Amy to be going against her like pacifist values. Yeah. And also, I was just rooting for her and him so much, yeah. so there was that as well. Yeah. No, I love that. I love your ending. I think the reason it doesn't do that is a couple of, of, of reasons. Um, number one, it was 1952, right? Mm -hmm. And so yes. any kind of interracial coupling was very taboo there, you know, at, at, at the time, mm -hmm. and especially black-white, you know. So even to have a white woman or be touched by uh, a man of color was a really, it was very taboo on screen. So much so, you all probably know about Shirley Temple and Bilbo Jingles Robinson and how some of their dance sequences, even though she was a child, some of their dance sequences were edited and censored in the South. So that's how intense it was. So I agree with you that that if the film were remade today, mm -hmm. you know, we'd have probably have the Katie Horado character, you know, get together with Will Kane, but I feel like Will Kane doesn't quite deserve Katie no, Hirado, right? Yeah. <laughs> you like, yeah, right? Like she, she, you want her to just go off and be fabulous because you know she will, right? And, yeah, and I feel true. like he, you know, he's kind of chosen Amy over her, and Katie's kind of just like the Katie Hirado character, uh, Mrs. R uh, Ramirez, I think her name is. Is kind of like, yes. well, you know, um, she um, she knows that she's too good for him and and mm -hmm. is is moved on beyond him, uh, so. That feels right to me because I don't, you know, I, I don't see Will Kane at that point as being the catch no, for her, so right? Cool. Right? You know, and I see Professor Warner's laughing, right? But I, so I don't being the catch for her. She has she has better things in store for her, and um, and and Amy is there to rescue Will Kane. But I like your ending. I I like I like what you said now too, <laughs> and I'm wondering if it was made today, would she be Amy or would she be Will Kane? And maybe that could be interesting to think about. Good. But Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank Loved you. your answers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Who's next? Yay. Hello. Um, hi. Uh, I'm Kayla. I'm a junior here. I have like told you that already, but I'm an English and history major. Oh. Um, and one thing that we actually talked about um, when Dr. Garrett Davis came to speak to our class was that the Western genre kind of exists as propaganda for colonialism. Yeah. Um, and so 
like you talk a lot about like either the, the New York Times review um, about how about like the desegregation of this mythology and like how like black people deserve to participate in this mythology and like see it represented. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts as to like that as like a, a, a black liberatory project while um, the mythology of the West is so intrinsically um, colonial and is like very capitalist as yes, well. Yes, absolutely it is. But th I'm sure that there were communities of color in which blacks and Indians co you know, uh, cohabitated, coexisted. We know this. So why is that not depicted in film culture, right? So there could have been, so along the lines of, of Poitier's Buck and the Preacher, there could have been a whole other way in which black American, Native American communities, coalitions, syncretisms were depicted in American cinema that have not yet been depicted. So that that's open territory. That's open for those of you who are aspiring film uh, makers, screenwriters, television writers. That's like wide open for you to to reimagine the West in ways it has not been imagined, but is probably more historically accurate than it has been imagined thus far, right? So I would encourage those of you who are, are thinking with a post-colonial lens, you know, on um, to develop those characters, those stories that certainly existed. You can go into the archive, find threads of stories and pieces and develop a whole world around uh, some of those coalitions and those communities. And you're absolutely right. The way in which the Western has functioned historically has been in this very colonial way. Yeah. Thank Great. you. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm a junior at CMC studying international relations with government. Um, I'm interested in looking at like contemporary Westerns that we've discuss, discussed, like Snope and Django and How Far Do They Fall. How do you see the genre of the Western changing for better or for worse? Excellent. I love the question. I see the genre changing for the better in that we are seeing Jordan Peele's make films. We are seeing even folks like, and we talked today in class about Tarantino, who I have issues with. I'm still in therapy over, you know, <laughs> over some of But um, I see filmmakers trying to be more inclusive, to be more historically accurate, to, even though they take liberties with some of that history, to um, make the, their depiction of the West more nuanced and complicated in terms of having more communities of color interacting. So I see those positive changes happening. I'm, I would love to see more development of women's characters and women's roles in the West. Uh, so often the genre focuses so much on masculinity to the exclusion of women, as if there were no women. Obviously we know there were some women out there. Um, and how women coped, how women survived out there. You know, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about McCabe and Mrs. Miller is the centrality of the female character, right, uh, Mrs. Miller. And she, yes, she is a prostitute. Yes, she runs the brothel. But she's also the brains behind his operation. So what if that story had been developed in, in more complicated ways, right? So I think there's room for those of you, especially young people, interested in storytelling in developing new stories. Thank you. You're welcome. Great question. Other people. Hi, Professor Warner. Hi, I'm Nick Warner. I teach in the literature department. And um, I wanted to ask if you could, um, well, first of all, preface to that, just going back to the ending of High Noon, I think there's a lot of interesting things there. And I, I too, uh, was rooting for you know Katie Harado to come running off the in a way, though, it's typical of Zinnemann that he likes the moral complications of Amy. That's a, that's a Zinnemann move, mm -hmm. to have Amy shoot the guy in the back, to have the Quaker woman shoot the guy in the back. This is also the same director who fought with the producers to cast Deborah Carr in From Here to Eternity as the woman who's having the adulterous affair because up until that time, she'd been cast as the prim and proper, very British, very proper, almost staid character. And he really pulled that, that became electrifying that she was the woman who was having the adulterous passionate affair with Burt Lancaster. That's a typical Zinnemann kind of move. So that's probably what he would say, you know, if he were here, he liked to do that with women's roles. So it's interesting. That, yeah, and those yeah. kind of role reversals are great dramaturgy, right? Because yeah. they're not, I mean, there's, they're, you're absolutely right to say that's an auteurist 
sort of in an auteurist vein, that's a Zinnemann move, but it's, it's also um, you know, a common move in cinema to, 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 um, to enact that role reversal in a particular yeah, to way. To do that twist. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, Helen Ramirez, Katie Harada, none of those guys in that movie were up to her exactly. speed. You exactly. Know? Certainly anyway. not Will Kane, yeah. although the film wants you to think he yes, is, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> He's not good enough for her. But I wanted to ask if you could comment a little bit on the history of the term cowboy. Yeah. Oh, and thank that, you, you know, Professor Warren. Thank you, yes. Um, and I and had intended to do that. So there is quite a bit of uh, evidence, mounting evidence in history and in linguistics uh, around uh, the term cowboy, where people are re-examining the etymology of this term and are discovering that uh, contrary to what we have long thought uh, was the case, that cowboy was this term that uh, has always or has forever referred to the Anglo-Saxon cowboy or you know white cowboys, it is more likely, there's a lot of evidence that it's more likely that it was a portmanteau for, for go get that cowboy and that was a directive used on ranches and plantations for the slave labor that worked on these ranches and plantations as uh, cow herders, right? So there were, um, and, and the reason why it's a bit in contention is there are people who push back and say, but the Spanish word caballero, uh, though it means, can mean gentleman, it also has meant uh, a, a rider, a, a, an equestrian, a, a man of, of horsemanship. Uh, it has, is true, you know, truly the term that may undergird or may be um, an antecedent to the term cowboy. I think it's, I mean, language is so complicated and always evolving and used by many, by many people and many cultures. It may very well be the case that both narratives are true, that it's both caballero um, that has influenced the term, the evolution of the term cowboy, and that cowboy became this portmanteau for go get that cowboy, which is, a, is there's a lot of evidence that that's how the word came to um, be in usage and in practice. Um, uh, but it may be that both are the case. So I, I um, struggling with that and, and always researching it, but the reason why uh, one of the uh, additional reasons why uh, uh, historians and linguists think that that's the case is, as you all may know, about a third of the inhabitants of the West were, before slavery ended, were slaves. And they were the laborers doing the work on ranches, southern ranches and plantations. And then after slavery ended, most of those people remained on those ranches and plantations. Some moved further west, but many remained for many years. So a third of the, some came out to California, but about a third of the inhabitants were African American. And so many of the laborers doing that work were in fact African American. Thank you, Professor Warner. Yeah. Hi, I'm Meher. I'm a junior at CMC, and I'm studying psychological science and literature. Um, I know you said something about you know sharing with us why you decided to call your book Black Rodeo. Yes. Um, you know, I'm just curious about sort of how your thought process was behind sort of picking that particular title because there seems to be like a bunch of collections of films that you've sort of analyzed and yes. worked on. Yes. So I was just wondering how you sort of like pin down that particular title. Yes, thank you, I love the question. Because I loved the way Canoe's film uh, called attention to the existence of uh, rodeo culture uh, and Western culture as alive and well and constitutive of, or sort of hybrid uh, and, and constitutive of African American culture. So we had tended to, we tended to think for such a long time that African American culture was, you know, necessarily urban, right? And necessarily, you know, come, came out of the Great Migration to the cities, New York, Chicago, uh, and that that's where contemporary African American culture grew up through the Harlem Renaissance uh, and, and evolved, and that's how it evolved. And there has been, until recently, there was sort of scant attention paid to other 
African American cultures and uh, African American Western idioms. So I liked the fact that the rodeos demonstrated the existence of uh, a vibrant rodeo and Western idioms, lifestyles, musical uh, uh, musical practices and uh, musical appreciation, bl black country music. Uh, that hadn't really, that wasn't really getting attention. And so there was this kind of essentialist way that blackness and black popular culture were being written about, talked about as, distinctive, as distinctively and particularly urban. And so I thought it was an intervention to say, well, that's not necessarily true. And the term black rodeo kind of enacted that intervention. And as, as I was doing the research for the book, and even among colleagues, I'd say, you know, um, you know the title of the book's Black Rodeo. And even until recently, people have said, there are black cowboys? Or, you know, there, there are black rodeos? So they, just the reaction to the title and the reaction to the book speaks volumes to me. Uh, and people being surprised that there were, like people said, are there enough films to write a whole book about? I mean, as you see, there were several films that I don't even write about, Man and Boy, Blazing Saddles, um, you know, the Wild Wild West with Will Smith, it, this kind of didn't make the cut. You know, I mean, there we talk about s some films being high or low quality. At dinner we were talking about um, the fact that, you know, uh, it, films are not always going to be high art. Well, there are certainly films in my book that are not high art, but some of the ones I excluded definitely <laughs> didn't, <laughs> like, definitely don't make the cut. You know what I mean? So, Adios Amigos, you know, Joshua, which was a a kind of exploitation film starring uh, Fred Williamson. It was just way too schlocky to make the cut. So I named, that's why I titled it Black Rodeo and uh, um, why some films are there and some are not. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a senior studying literature. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, in Westerns, like especially with the limited role that women often play in like these films and books, um, there's like a lot of homoerotic undertones and sometimes certainly it's more overt. Yeah. And I was curious if you've come across any of that in your um, research, um, yeah. Yes, the Western is deeply homoerotic genre, absolutely. That's why I foreground, you know, and always wanna say, remember, this is a genre that's about masculinity. And um, uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, there are some, as you say, some overt scenes like in Red River, right? for example, that, that come to mind. And um, then there are very contemporary or more recent films like Brokeback Mountain that utilize the Western as a backdrop. We're also talking about um, homoeroticism and homoerotic relations and, and more specifically homosocial environments, right? Because so much of the labor done by these cattle rustlers and, and um, cowboys was labor done more often by men. And so it created homosocial environments. And there is quite a bit of good uh, literature about how these men coped with those homosocial environments. So yeah, th there, I definitely encountered that. And in the supporting literature that was more historical, I c encountered that more than in the uh, cinema studies literature that was about the films. It seems that like it, there wasn't as much that was examining um, that except in a you know, few films, the obvious examples like the scenes between Matt Garth and, and um, Cherry in, um, in Red River, right? Um, Matthew Cherry and, and Matt Garth in, in Red River, or um, some of the sort of the one lines in a few films. But cinema studies hasn't really delved as deeply into the homoeroticism of the Western that I can, can think of. But it's a great question because though there are a lot of homosocial environments in which it's just under the surface, right? It's just, it's kind of implied. Yeah. Hi, my name is Aileen. I'm a senior studying international relations and history here. Um, so I'm currently taking a Korean cinema and culture class. And Is it Korean cinema? Yeah, Korean cinema and culture. And the very first film that we watched was a kimchi western. Um, it was called The Good, The Bad, and The Weird, which um, I don't know if you watched The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. It's, a, that's a, it's based off of that, which is a spaghetti western. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, what are your thoughts on the like, western genre being carried over to different geographical and cult uh, like country contexts? I love it. I, you know, I, what I also um, 
love about the Western is its malleability. And um, I, you know what, one of the slides, I, I don't know if I got it, I didn't get a chance. Oh, can I pull the slideshow back up? Is that okay? Um, one of the slides I didn't get a chance to show you, to show you because I was racing through the presentation is, um, is a slide that talks about or shows how malleable the Western is. And so I love the fact that we can, oh, thank you so much, Brian, that we can uh, see its trans uh, mission, its uh, mutations, its variations in other forms, both uh, the, like individual films, like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, getting transformed and relocated, as well as various tropes within the Western uh, showing up in other places. So I love that kind of intertextuality. You know, I mean, that's, those, are, those, th those are the moments that are so fun for those of us who are cineasts, right? Getting to see the ways in which film is intertextual, is in dialogue with other films, and is signifying on filmmaking, and is kind of a global language in some ways, right? So that, that's really uh, enjoyable, and kind of the payoff for those of us who watch a lot of movies, right, is to, to be in on those jokes and those references. So to your question, I just wanted to, okay, so I had a few other slides, but I was running out of time, which is why I apologize for speeding up there at the end. But this slide was um, a slide, if I had gotten to it, I was gonna, uh, make a similar point to your question, which is, you know, we see the malleability of the Western in a variety of um, products in, on, in the marketplace today, right? So whether we're talking about the tension between uh, Gustavo Fring and Walter White in um, Breaking Bad, right, which Vince Gillian himself often referred, the creator, writer, often referred to as uh, a Western, uh, uh, or we're talking about a police procedural like Justified with Walton Goggins and Timothy Oliphant right here, right? I don't know how many people have seen that. Or we're talking about an environmental uh, um, show that is about the impact of global warming on um, the, uh, on the environment and, and, and natural catastrophes like fortitude, which though set very much not in the West, but in the far, far North, even its title, the title of the show, Fortitude, e evokes the, the Western, uh, the lexicon, if you will, of the Western. Um, Michelle Thackeray in Godless, right, is very much, I mean, here you have a, you know, Downton Abbey, <laughs> the, the, the queen of Downton Abbey, right? Um, the woman who starred in Downton Abbey as a, um, as a figure on, on the Western plains and uh, on the frontier. Westworld with its attention to AI and bioethics and um, the ethics of um, artificial intelligence, calling our attention to um, the, the Western in this sort of futuristic landscape and even the way in popular political discourse or late night TV, right? The political um, campaigns of various administrations and the uh, unbridled military expeditions of our government are lampooned in tropes uh, that are Western related. I think we see, to your question, my dear, the malleability of the genre. Great question. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It was really insightful. Um, my name is Talia. I'm a sophomore at CMC. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about, so when I've studied the Western frontier, it's always been portrayed as this like beacon of hope, yes. um, somewhere you can go to that's free and, and wild and boundless. Um, but then in Buck and the Preacher, we have this monologue um, that Ruby Dee has, and she talks about how the land has been poisoned, and she has this desire to leave and go to Canada, and she sees the Western frontier as kind of a, a limit and a boundary. And I was just, wondering like what your understanding of it is in this like diverging context of seeing it as like this expansion versus a boundary and how to contextualize that in the Western movie. Beautiful question. I think we can in, could have envisioned it very easily as, um, as a boundless frontier of opportunity uh, if we all had white privilege. Right? But in fact, uh, so many people don't have white privilege and have not been able to, um, to 
experience the United States as uh, we say we, you know, as the nation has been sort of been set up to um, to function and have not had access to um, to civil rights, have not have have. Um, access to to opportunity to free choice. So I, what I like about that film is it's calling attention to the fact that the Western frontier is not function as that liberating space. I mean, it was for many people where they got away from the South, but even that journey, right? What what Buck and the Preacher does is focus on that journey. And more recently, we're talking at dinner and earlier in class this afternoon about um, the Underground Railroad and the way you see her journey is so heart-wrenching, right? And at the end, sorry, spoiler alert, she does make it out, but like at what cost, right? And it has been so devastating that the journey just to, to now finally be uh, turning west and, and leaving the, that, that the plantocracy behind has just been, you know, takes you, the spectator, through this really heart-wrenching uh, um, series. So. I think what I what we want to again acknowledge in and appreciate is the malleability, right? That the Western, for some, and the Western landscape has been a um, a landscape of promise, of opportunity. But even for those for whom it's become that, the journey to get there has been very difficult. So it's always already both. To answer your question, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for your questions, and thank you again to our speaker, Professor Mask, for her talk. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>